Guys, good Tuesday morning. My name is Jerry Miller, and welcome to Real Talk here on the I Love Seville Network. This is an insider's guide to real estate life and the pursuit of happiness. And today is an especially great day to be above the mud because the fabulous Mrs. Erpy has contributed tasty treats, <laughs> um, Italian cookies, mm-hmm. to the show. Yep. And I cannot wait to eat this. I just need to get through this intro where we <laughs> thank um, the sponsors and introduce our fellows before I take a bite of this. I, I will be mm-hmm. talking with my mouth full of tasty <laughs> treats. But Mrs. Erpy, thank you kindly for this fabulous Italian cookie. Um, first, we want to thank Yes Realty Partners for making the program possible. Yes Realty Partners, you can find them online. And if you look on the bottom of the screen, you will see just trusted advisors in the real estate game that you can count upon. And speaking of trusted advisors, Judah Wickhauer is one of them. If we could go to the, the fu- is it a five shot we're doing here? How do we get Nick and, uh, and Keith in there? Is it a, a four shot they have that's to share expanded? A shot. They have to share a shot. They're sharing. Is that what they are doing we're here? We're sharing a mic. We're sharing a mic. Show. Yeah. Sharing we're coffee. sharing a shot. Hello, Judah's eating a tasty uh, treat uh, right Judah's now, Mrs. Herbie. That is multitasking. I see now. that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop talking. Good morning, fellas. Now good I'm going to eat here. Good morning, Jerry. How you doing? <laughs> this Great is one of my favorite. I, they're, they're, when the Herpes visit, um, I always walk out a little bit smarter. So and this is the opportunity for Jerry to say something, but I, I, made, I timed it so he had food in his mouth. <laughs> there he so he wouldn't have to. Thank you, Mrs. Herpes. <laughs> <Herbie. laughs> like, you're you're so kind, though. You're so you know, kind. This is wonderful. We, we have, Jerry, we have wonderful people bringing us treats all the time. Uh, my waistline is not appreciating <laughs> it so much, but that is outstanding. And it, um, the tricolor being gone. You, you just close your eyes. It's delicious. It's just the flavor. Yeah. It's, 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 it's abso- absolutely it's delicious. It's delicious. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's the no. best. Yeah. yeah. Very good. So today is normally the Batman and Robin show on Tuesday, but we kind of did that yesterday. So driving in, I was trying to think Batman and Robin and I guess the Super Friends. The super I, friends. I don't really know <laughs> the how super we friends. can tie all that. Tie that well, all we in. should ask what their favorite um, super alter egos are. There you go. Ooh. Well, we, why, did, that why once, we, we did that once. But why don't uh, we'll start with Xavier? With me, sure. Introduce yourself and tell us who your uh, alter ego is. So I'm Xavier Erpe and uh, I'm a uh, partner at Merchant Financial Services and I enjoy working with um, you know families, individuals. It's just a lot of fun talking to people and, and helping them along. But my, 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 I guess when I was growing up, my favorite superhero, and I had a lot, believe me, um, but it had to be Flash because when I was a little kid, I used to Flash. love to run and I wanted to be the fastest and it wasn't always the case. So um, I wanted to be Flash. And now that I've seen Justice League and if you've seen the the – the Snyder, Snyder cut, cut. Yeah. you see that if without Flash, it would have been all over. So I'm pretty important, aren't I? Xavier Flash Erpy. That's right. Good morning, my friend. Good morning. Xavier yeah. Flash Erpy. The closer. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's got a lot of nicknames in the program. And how about uh, the Antonio Banderas, the financier? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. He really <laughs> loves that moniker. Can you yeah. tell? Yeah. He, he loves it. Yeah. I don't know. It, does, it, it does tickle me. Does that, yeah. I remember Antonio Banderas from Zorro. It was the man. Oh, he, was, he was the dad. Catherine Zeta Jones. He was yeah. the man. He was wearing a mask yeah. a lot of the time. She's so. a beautiful lady. Like, like yeah. Batman. Like Batman. Like, like, there you go. <laughs> Like no, so I'm Alex Erpy. I'm the CEO yeah, of Emergent Financial Services. Also just worked with individuals, helping them plan for retirement, financial planning, thinking about it. Love working also with like people on the underside that are th- beginning to get into the process of saving and investing. Nothing makes me happier than to see someone who's like in their 20s, 30s, getting off on a great start so that I just know that their retirement is going to be fantastic. Um, so really enjoy that. My superhero, so I mean... Batman was my favorite growing up, but to not take Batman, because I know Batman is, is covered. Batman's been claimed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also big on... I'm honest, lately, I love Aquaman from Aquaman. Zack Snyder's Justice League. He's so... Uh, the new Jason one. Jason Momoa. Jason yeah. Momoa. He's, He's the so man. He's so awesome. He is so awesome. And, yeah, but but and back in the 60s, what was Aquaman's yeah. really power, right? You know, the, the fish. fish. And I guess, oh, and the the fish. Mean, well, Alex Rose is 29 now. years old. Yeah. 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 I don't master, know if he knows. But now the he's 60s. the master of the ocean. He doesn't speak to fish. He can control the waves. Oh, he tends to breathe underwater. So kind of like a Poseidon. Yeah, kind yeah. of like a Poseidon. He can he's create a tsunami. We got Flash, which totally makes sense. Aquaman, but we'll, we'll, we'll run with it. Like I'm sticking Walker. with the DC. I like I'm sticking Man. with the DC. I thought Captain America is my second favorite. Oh, okay. I do love him. I can't I wait to hear this man. Say well, I was going to say, it's kind of ironic that you asked the superheroes because just knowing Alex, he always preferred when we were growing up the villains. 
he was a big villain for like yeah, he was. Darth Vader. He loves all the we, Darth, he we, loved the villains. So I was like, he's saying that now, but like I also know that Alex did, loved the. He had like cool. He loved what was his stuff. name? Uh, the android from Justice oh, League. Oh, uh, Amazo. Amazo. He Amazo. always loved Amazo. So I'm like, so he's talking we, about like we had a board of supervisors sitting in, and we did the same thing. So hey, look, you know, mm-hmm. and he said Titanium Man, and, 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 and Chris Fairchild said, "You realize that's a villain?" He goes, "Yeah, I'm good with that." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a true story. Yeah. You know what? It fits him. Yeah. Well, sometimes the, the sometimes the villains are really great. Yeah. But uh, so Nick, tell us about you, buddy. So I am the chief financial planner of. Emerging Financial Services, the CMO as well um, of Emerging Financial Services. You do so a great job. I love Al- Thank you. And I love Alex says he loves it when people start getting started. And my job is so that when they exit, they exit well. Mm. So that's the whole point of the financial plan is to make sure that people are on track. They, to they be clear, exit their working life. Exit their working not life. Not their whole life. Yes, not their whole life. <laughs> I, I was implying their <laughs> financial life, but okay. But um, we're going to talk about that because that edge of that life is growing. A working life is kind of growing a little. Yeah, bit now, it's pushing. Yeah, yeah. It is. Mm-hmm. So who's your superhero? My super. Well, since there's nobody left, I will pick Superman. I d- always mm-hmm. loved. So it's interesting because Go on. I I was pretty, I uh, loved Superman. Guy. Well, yeah, I lo- I love because well, I will admit that I really really enjoyed. So I'm a big fan of Zack Snyder's films, and I love Man of Steel, like his version of Superman. And I know it's very controversial, but I, I love I love uh, Henry Cavill's portrayal. I love the movies, and I love what Zack Snyder did with the character. So I'm I would say like that's yeah that Superman is is just who who figure. did the skit Opera Man? What mm-hmm. what comedian did the skit Opera Man? Opera Man. There, there, no, it was an SNL skit, and I can't remember what it was. We'll have Opera. to look it up. We'll have to. We'll have somebody. will have. Judy, to Google. do you know that answer? The go- somebody will have to Google that. But there was a there was a, an SNL Opera Saturday Night Live skit called Opera Man, <laughs> and I could have sh- sure you were going to pick that one. <laughs> if I had known about it, I might have. Well, it's been, so, gentlemen. Excuse me. Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler. Sandler, Sandler and that Opera Man, yeah. and it was SNL, right? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Oh. Look at that, huh? Smith got one right today. Yeah. 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 See, we came away with some knowledge too. Adam Sandler knowledge, right? Huh? Huh? (laughs) Thanks to you. So, guys, um, I don't really have too much on the on plan today. I just really want to have fun and see what the feed feeds back. But um, I would like to start, and one of you gentlemen jump in, whoever feels the right the right thing, is give us a little 101 primer, high level. What inflation is and why should we care? Because let's face it, we're at numbers now that we haven't seen that nice or an 82. 40, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we haven't seen time. it. So I'd really like to kind of talk a little bit about what that, what that means, how it impacts our lives, where it's going. <laughs> um, this so-called transitory, which does not sound or feel very transitory to <laughs> exactly. me. Exactly. And then we'll weave it into some real estate, and, and I think Nick has some numbers we might crunch. Absolutely. So I mean, I'm, I'm happy to jump in with this one. I'm, yeah. I love. I love. You talking could do about the theoretical. The theoretical. CPI. The theoretical. <laughs> <relation. laughs> one on one with the professor, and then we'll move on to Xavier. <laughs> All I know is when back, I prep yeah. on the pre-show, when I said this, Nick was trying to take my wallet and go, "I'll show you." <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, there is a do little state you can do with it. I always, I always joke that inflation is basically, and I will use a little bit of the Wall Street, so inflation is, the joke version is the Federal Reserve when you're sleeping at night, going like this, and taking something out of your wallet. Oh, look at that. And hiding That was a $100 <laughs> bill. No, <laughs> it's, it's a $10 bill. It should be like a It was 100 but now it's 10 That's right. But, 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 but I saw a <laughs> meme on it, and that is true, that it, it's worth, how much is that 10 bucks worth now? Well, Think it about was, it. If you've got ten is worth nine you, now. Yeah, if you've got it, basically with the inflation we've seen, that nine point seven percent, basically ten dollars is worth nine dollars. If you begin to to take that down, and basically, so what inflation is? Inflation is an increase in the price of goods, and in the simplest form, inflation is Cause when by. the price of goods goes up. Now, well, there can be different causes, right? Um, sometimes it can be supply side based. In other words, you're having, which I think some of what we're seeing now. In other words, when you when producers have trouble getting goods to market, they can't find the raw materials, they can't find the transportation. The price of these goods goes up because now it's more expensive for them to get them to market. But you can also have inflation in the classical way of Milton Friedman once called it: it's too much money tasting after too few goods. In other words, if you put a bunch of money into the system, right? You pump. If I created. $4 trillion out of thin air and just started handing it out. 
tossing it around, just going out in the street of Charlottesville and throwing money around. Stimulus money? You mean what we did? What we just yeah. did, right? If you think about it, now everyone has a bunch more money. So the value of each individual dollar goes down. And I think that's something that some, isn't intuitive to people. We think of, everyone knows law of supply and demand, right? If everybody wants a water bottle, the fewer water bottles there are, the more expensive each water bottle is. What I think a lot of people don't realize is that money works the same way. Like money, dollars, works exactly the same way. The more dollars there are, the less each dollar is worth. But because we use dollars to buy other things, that means if dollars are worth less, everything else costs more. So that's your simple inflation. When you see the number on TV that says inflation is at 6%, inflation is at 9%, what they're usually talking about is something called the CPI, and that's the Consumer Price Index. And that is basically, they go around, the government goes around, surveys the price of a very large basket of goods. And they combine all these goods together, the different, because each goods are going to go up a different price. Eggs is not up the same percent as bread. Bread's going to be up differently than propane. Propane's going to be different than wood. So the government combines them all into one basket and then adjusts this basket. They adjust this inflation number to compensate for basically increase in quality. So if you think about it, right, let's say in year, in 2021, I have a car that just runs and it's a plain car. 2022, we come up with a new car, which costs twice as much, but this new car has a fancy computer in it. It, auto, it runs all by itself. It parts by itself. I think it's called a Tesla. It's called a Tesla, right? <laughs> Extra component. As the government will come and say, well, even though this new Tesla is twice as expensive as the old one, it's a better car. So it really, the inflation of the Tesla wasn't 100%. It was something like 50%. Because they're trying to figure out what's, how much did the price go up regardless of the quality. And so that's what ends up in the number you see on TV. So, Xavier, we've been through this in 82. It's in the 70s. In the 70s. In but, the 80s. But I remember 82, because I was at the age to remember it. Um, <laughs> really? You had to laugh in my ear, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so what's different about this time around versus 82? So there's, there's a whole bunch of things that are different this time around, right? First of all, so you way back then, back in the 82s, you know, when you were around and understood this stuff, right? <laughs> um, I didn't say I understood it. I said I was around. You, you were around and, and well, you, you began to feel the impact. And I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, older now and probably still don't understand it. Yeah, the issue back then was that we had a roaring economy. Right at that point in time, and therefore, is as Alex said, it's just the economy was very hot. There was a lot of demand for supply, and the supply couldn't keep up with the demand. Therefore, inflation began to go up. Second of all, if you remember well, we had the issue with gas prices and oil prices, right? So oil prices going through the roof because OPEC was really starting to crunch and say, we're just going to cut back, and therefore oil prices were going, you know, back then when you had, you know, you had gas prices at, you know, basically less than a dollar a gallon, now all of a sudden there were dollar fifty, two dollars, and in addition to that there were shortages, right? So that caused the inflation. The difference was that at that point in time, the Federal Reserve was, had the ability to raise rates quickly over time in order to begin to squash inflation. And that wasn't an issue back then. And the, really, and the reason it wasn't an issue is that they didn't, they didn't have, you know, $6 trillion, $9 trillion in the balance sheet. They had almost zero in the balance sheet, right? So it wasn't an issue. Um, today, we're at a different perspective because, one, inflation is not really being caused by a roaring economy. It's being caused by the fact that so much money was, was generated through the stimulus package that all that money – and remember, this happened also in 2008, 2009, right? We, bang, we began to stimulate the economy then. Where did all that money go? It didn't go into the economy. It went into the stock market. You know, that, mm -hmm. That's where you saw the inflation, right? Here, what happened? You had the same kind of stimulus, but people sat back and say, I can't go out, I can't go shopping, I can't go to the stores anymore, I can't go to the, you know, I can't go travel because of the pandemic. So people began to buy online, right? They invested also, you saw the stock market take off in 2020, but they began to buy online. What the fact is, you have a supply chain issue because if there, aren't, if there isn't anybody working and everybody is staying home because, you know, they have to or because of the pandemic, 
then you have a supply crunch. In other words, there's not enough supply for the demand that there is, right? And so we've seen that type of inflation as opposed to a roaring economy and say, well, this economy is just on fire. It isn't on fire, right? It's just the fact that you have a situation where you have a, you know, you have a supply side issue, right? So that's the that's kind of the difference of inflation. This so how to you know how to control this inflation is going to be a lot tougher because we're a very low interest rate environment, and in order to get that inflation under control, means that you'd have to raise interest rates way beyond the inflation rate. Which is if it's if it's nine and a half right now. I don't see them rising interest rates to 10%. So again, those are the slight differences. And you know, I always say, even though history repeats itself, it, there's always nuances that change. Sure. So, so Nick, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't usually inflation and unemployment run concurrent? In this case, it seems the opposite, unless I'm mistaken. Isn't inflation going up and unemployment is going down? Historically, is, is the reverse. Yeah. Oh, uh, do so I have the, the yeah. old the, Phillips curve. Right. I mean, no, 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 go ahead. Yeah, the professor, <laughs> like if you wanted to. No, the, the idea is that originally, um, so uh, there was, so an economist who's, I can't remember his first name, last name, Phillips, saw a correlation using, unfortunately, and this is also part of the problem, is that his data was from 18, the 1860s. He was doing his work in 1960. Um, and he noted a correlation. He, didn't note, he did not speculate that it was a causation, but he noted a correlation between rising inflation and lower unemployment. unemployment. And his theory was that small increases, or at least the beginning of an increase in prices, um, Send, sends a false signal to businesses that something is worth more and therefore you expand into that area. So, for instance, like if you were, I mean, think about uh, if you were a hardware salesman and all of a sudden you saw sc screws going up in prices, you're like, I can sell more screws. Because, I have to make more screws. Or I'll, make more, I'll buy more screws to sell because I can make more money on them. And so, but then, of course, that causes expansion. So you're going to hire another person to you know to be like well he's going to work in the screw department and all of a sudden it, these things are managed that was the speculation now obviously there's a lot of economists and i believe including milton friedman who did not believe that the phillips curve mm -hmm. was ever correct because he did not necessarily go through proving whether it, it was ever correct or not it, it, it has is, ceased to work in the last and part of the important reason now right it's it's working a little bit now but see, the problem is again, it's it could be with the issue with correlation causation things is that they don't seem to work. Like in the in the seventies and eighties, it was completely broken. Yeah. So in the seventies, with stagflation, you had high inflation and you had high unemployment. Mm. Exactly. So it it broke, and the the implication being there when you intentionally pursue inflation as a means to reduce unemployment, it doesn't work. Hmm. Because if everyone is conscious of the inflation, see the the key of the Phillips curve, if it was ever correct, was the fact that it was an unconscious event, right? A business owner did not believe that it was inflation that was going up. He believed that the value of something was going up, therefore was desiring I mean, to sell more and make more. You know, if you were, manu again, probably a better example would have been the manufacturer seeing like screw prices were going up, so he makes more screws. Yeah. So he hires more people to make more screws. If, if you are aware that inflation is higher because the Federal Reserve is intentionally pursuing a higher inflation in order to reduce unemployment, you're not going to necessarily produce more screws because you don't think they're more valuable. You believe that the, the value of money is going down. It's not a, it's not a mm -hmm. signal as a business or an economic signal that you should produce more X good, therefore you should hire more people. The other thing that we're going on right now is that like as – the Federal Reserve is intentionally saying we're using the Phillips curve, we're examining this and that. More people are aware of the Phillips curve. There's a good chance that even if it ever did work, it's not going to work in the future because if you, again, it's just one of those, um, it's probably more like the Austrian School of Economics where people, if you are aware of something, it's going to change your behavior. It's a lot of game theory, which is the, always the catch with economics is the game theory aspect where if somebody, if another party is aware of the third party in the room, their behavior is going to change. So my father-in-law uh, was a doctor of economics, an Austrian, matter of yeah. fact, mm -hmm. and he used to say, you know, economics is more emotion than it is numbers. Yeah, yeah. I agree 100%. That, yeah. It is. It is 100%. And, and any thoughts, Jerry? No, I'm, I'm listening. Keep going. People's yeah. behavior changes is, yeah. is, what, is what we're seeing now, and I think the issue is, again, as Nick said, you, you're not – what we're seeing now – 
is that it's not so much a matter of, oh, I think the economy is roaring on all cylinders, air drum to produce more goods and hire more people. We're seeing my supply chain is crunched. My resources that I use to produce these goods in other words, we're not really seeing a ramp up like you looked at the car companies as an example. It's not like we're seeing a ramp up in car production. But they can't. The issue is that they can't. Yeah. And right. that's the that's what's causing the increase in so prices. So is, is that the reason why somebody's using the word transitory? No, I think originally the concept was there was transitory is because we went we went from an economy that dropped to zero, right? I mean, we shut down our economy. Well, we so, also thought it was labor shortage, supply chain, and we thought that they would be remedied and solved. True. It, well, mm -hmm. well, that was the point. Yeah, yeah. I know what I was going to say was, what, and, and the numbers, what happens is you got, you got an inflation number that went almost to zero, right? When you start from a lower base and you start increasing prices, it looks like inflation is going sure. to be very high, right? But they figured, well, that's just transitory. No, it's just temporary because of what we're seeing. But in the end, it hasn't. It's turned out not to I mean, be transitory. I mean, what are we? Fourteen. Fourteen months into transitory. Yeah. Exactly. Well, to yeah. be fair, also the labor force participation rate is not where it was in 2019 either, which is going to affect the unemployment rate as well. Exactly. Because well, there's, there's yeah. just and not as many people. Because remember, the unemployment rate also uh, unemployment rate also discludes people who are not looking for work. So you guys are way smarter than I'll ever be um, on this stuff, and thank you for doing it. I'm learning stuff as, as you guys are talking. Um, but this is a real estate show, so how is this going to impact real estate? Is it? Is it not? I know yeah. it's going to impact new construction. That's the simple answer, mm -hmm. right? right? Right. Because two by fours are exactly. more expensive, your, labor your is more materials. expensive. But I'm really asking it more from a from a resale perspective, mm. right? Does that have? Is it on its own track, or is is what's happening now going to slow this hot market down, increase inventory? Any thoughts, guys? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, everything, and, and you're right. I mean, you know, real estate has its own, it's its own little, you know. Um, ecosystem. Exactly, ecosystem, because you have, you come into a situation where for 10 years, right, and you probably know this better than I do, right, for 10 years, construction was low. Then all of a sudden we have a large demand because millennials are starting to buy houses and the supply's not there. So you have a supply demand issue, right? However, will inflation impact? I think it will. What will happen? Instead of having five people look at the same house or one bid on the same house, maybe they'll bid three or two. So housing may still go up in pricing, right? I just need to stop you there for a second. That's only a recent phenomenon, multiple people bidding on a house. It Historically, for 35 years, mm -hmm. you just have one, right. right? You didn't have two, you didn't have three, you didn't yeah. have mm -hmm. 20. So if we get back to one... Well, that's to, because of COVID. Yeah. We had a byproduct mm -hmm. of new buyers in the market because of COVID. Um, you know, from just layman's perspective, if we have less disposable income, we can potentially afford less house. Um, well, I was going to say, that's you, what I was interest thinking. rates, I mean, you look at exactly. interest rates, I mean, mortgage rates um, just six months ago at the beginning, right, at, at the beginning of, of last year, they were, what, under 3%. They're probably about 3.8% right now. So if you say there's a more or less a 1% increase and you've got, you got a mortgage of about $400,000, that's another $3,000 mm -hmm. a year, a year yeah. right? That's, mm -hmm. that's a big nut. I think the challenge is, as with a lot of individual markets, you always have competing forces, right, that sometimes are moving in, in different directions. And so the question is whose magnitude is stronger. In other words, the inflation in the general economy would generally be a damper on house prices. You have less disposable income, right, and you have higher mortgage rates, ergo you can afford less house. But on the obviously, we know that on the other side, you have a disconnect between supply and demand in housing, which pushes prices up in that market. So the real question is, which of the two forces Wait. is stronger? The stronger force will determine the direction of housing prices. And this up market, till now, the, the supply the and demand supply. has been a stronger force. Though. Yeah, the, and it probably will continue. And this market I mean, specifically. I think so. I, I can't mention the name, but I literally had a phone call from a, a, a very top executive at UVA this morning on the way in trying to find an upper end home mm. and can't find it. Wow. And was wondering if I knew of any new subdivision that was coming up or any new product that was coming up. I, I, I just know this person from a committee I sit mm -hmm. on. Um, and so this isn't 200,000. This is, this is a high end home. Mm -hmm. Right. And this particular individual's look saying, I, where do I go? Mm -hmm. So this is, not an this is not limited to a certain price point. No. It's all the way across the board. And to Xavier's point, um, it was 5.5 million units to be exact that we are short. These new construction units. 
for 10 years. Um, it went from roughly 1.2, 1.3 million new construction a year down to like 200. And it's Oof. just never been able never to recover. Up. This year we'll get close to that one, two, one, well, last year probably one, two, one, three, somewhere around that, that point. But there's that hole. And this conversation I had with this individual was is that, that it, it, the lack of those new construction lacks, uh, impacts all buyers across the profile. And that's what we have right now. On top of that, we have folks coming into the market that are working from outside the market with higher incomes, buying up even the limited inventory we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a good example, I reference this all the time, is, is our neighbor across the street who sold a town home in Northern Virginia for uh, a million four and bought a 5,000 plus square foot home for 800 and change, <laughs> dumped uh, 200K into it and renovated and still walked away with a huge cash. chunk of money. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. and, exactly. And, is, and, is, and has got Nova pay in Charlottesville. So like really like living the dream here. Yeah. Um, so what, what, what are your thoughts on, on where it's gonna go, um, Xavier? I mean, what are your thoughts on what's gonna happen over the next you know, year, 18 months, 24 months, maybe with housing and, and certainly with inflation? Well, I, I truly believe in housing um, and, and what Keith just mentioned, you just mentioned that the demand is still there, right? So as long as the demand continues to be strong and, and housing can't keep up with that demand, you're going to continue to see a very strong housing market, right? With regard to inflation, I think, I think the issue here is that most – I think most economists expect inflation to, to, to wane down. And what we're seeing now is that that's not the case. Inflation certainly is, you know, at this point much more, um, it's, it's much higher than we expected, and it's going to be um, probably a little longer than we expected. The Wall Street Journal must be watching, because I, I just got a notice about inflation, so they're, they're taking your words. <laughs> your words. Well, do we think that the, um, what the Fed's doing with the rate hikes are going to have any positive impact? for subsidizing these trends, or we just think what the Fed, Fed is doing with these rate hikes is going to spook the markets um, even more? I mean, it's been a choppy start that's, in Q1. That's tough to say whether they'll continue. Just one of the things you have to always remember about the markets is that the price, the markets are always forward looking. So a only an unexpected rate hike at this point would would spook them. In other words, an expected rate hike coming to fruition has already been priced into the so market. The, so you're saying that the, the stock market's already been priced into that? Okay. Exactly. In yeah. other you words, it's that? looking ahead. Yeah, we, we, well, there's no doubt about that. The bond market has already priced in at least Seven four. Seven rate hikes? No, I think they priced in four. Okay. And basically, yesterday when Bullard spoke, I mean, I think... St. Louis Fed? Yeah, I, th I think that's when he, sp he spooked the market. I mean, you saw... He spooked it last week. Yes, mm -hmm. because he's basically saying, we're going to do a, at least maybe seven, and he's thinking See, before July. Unexpected ones, because yeah. they were expecting four, you come out and say eight, you spooked them. And so like, you're talking about would, the 10-year? Why, why would a Bullard do that at the same time we got this Ukraine-Russia debacle going on? Um, at the same time, January was... Jerry, he's not thinking about the U.S.-Ukraine debacle. What he's thinking about is the fact that the Federal Reserve likes to use verbiage to start the process of whatever it is they're doing. So if they're... I mean, let's face it. Part of what you, we've been getting from the Federal Reserve, I said this last time and I'll say it again, is that there is a... I mean, they, there is a segment of... A, economics, or at least and the Federal Reserve thinkers fall into this category, that partially believe that declaring the actions kind of like helps them before they even have to do anything. So part of what it is, is they're starting to get all the kind of like the ground laid before they start taking these actions. So they're going to say what they think they need to say in order so that when they actually take these actions, these things start happening. I think Warning investors. And, um, okay, I mean, no, no, no. My dad's ready. Was ready to jump in. So is, his timing. I don't know. You guys are the pros. His timing's been horrendous. No, it has. It's like it when is. you're when you're at the prom and you're trying to kiss the date at the punch bowl as opposed to the the last song that's the slow song. <laughs> and you've and you've had some goodwill built over well, the evening. Well, remember when I think that's the what first, he did. The first he kissed her. Tried to kiss her at the punch bowl. The <laughs> first Fed chair did say. I believe it was the first Fed chairman. And so anyone in the feed can correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe the first person who was ever the Federal Reserve chairman did say. The goal of the Federal Reserve will be to take away the punch bowl before the party has even started. 
Literally those words. Those words, exactly. Wow. That is his quote. But well, I think, don't yeah, remember I'm not name. sure that's the case anymore, right? I mean, they haven't, no, done, they haven't done that for years. Um, but Jerry, I, I guess to your point, when, the, when is there a good time for the Fed to really say, you know, inflation has gotten out of hand, we need to raise rates, right? In other words, yes, is there, there's always something going on around the globe. And, and frankly, from a perspective of Ukraine and Russia's situation, I mean, that rallied the, the bond market, right? Bond market will really rally during that situation. The stock market doesn't do well. Did you notice they're pulling the troops back? Exactly. Yeah. Once they pull the troops back, the stock market's yep. up today, right? And bonds come down. So there really isn't a good time. Now, the, the, the issue I always have is that, you know, they've, they've been very, they've eased into this and they, they've, they've put themselves in a hole because they've done so much. And how do they unwind everything they've done? And that's, that's the key. I mean, they already stopped buying, right? Well, they're buying less. By the end of March, they will have stopped buying, right? The concept is maybe we should sell something. And going back to, to real estate, I mean, when you think about also what's happened with the mortgage market, right, is that the Fed stopped buying mortgages, right? Exactly. So since the Fed stopped buying mortgages, now we have a situation where the market has to buy those mortgages. So those interest rates go up. And, and the other thing that I thought was interesting is that, you know, private label mortgages, so in other words, most mortgages fall under agencies. I think if you borrow 450000 or less, it is a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan. So it's a federally backed Exactly, loan. exactly. So you put out the loan and agency packages it and sells it to the marketplace and it's got the backing of the agencies. Any, anything above that is a private label loan. And last year there was $140 billion, which is the highest since... You know what you guys call the the great uh, unpleasant. Time unpleasant. The time unpleasant. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Um, anytime. Um, <laughs> so Most folks just call it the recession. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we like um, to do things. That's what I. That's what I call it. When I know that you guys. Smith, Smith does not do things normal. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that's a market that you also have to sit back and say, at what point does the marketplace itself say, all right, there's too much supply. Therefore, I need something for that. And that means that interest has to go higher. For me to buy your product when I can buy something else, right, so you got to sell I just it. want to be clear. When we're talking about interest rates, we're talking about short-term interest rates. We're talking about 30-year. When you say interest rates, which, which, we're which rate We're talking about interest rates that will impact mortgage rates, right? right? Because that's, I mean, it's a real estate show. That's what got I'm con it. concentrating Thank on. So, almost <laughs> all rates. Appreciate so, that. So, yeah, almost all rates at this well, point. The, but really, the, the, I think the, the, the T-bill tracks this a little bit more than... The ten-year treasury. Well, the ten-year it's it tracks a thirty-year mortgage, right? That's exactly. And, right. Exactly. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, that's where, and, and there's two things as I mentioned. Not only does the ten-year treasury, but also there's a spread above that. So there's a risk. The ten-year supposedly is no risk in the sense of credit risk. Anything above that, anything other other than that, has some type of credit risk. Would be a corporate bond or a mortgage bond. A private label mortgage bond is going to have some credit risk. So if the that begins will be higher for that. So exactly. So if, if, if spreads begin rates. to widen, that means those rates are going to go higher. So that will have an impact on the mortgage for one. So we're going to, we've got Scott Morris coming in tomorrow for the Wednesday show, and it's one of the new trackings I'm doing to keep a track of the market mm -hmm. is the actual um, uh, <clears throat> mortgage rate, app, excuse me, mortgage application rate. So how many applications were made? you know, last week versus this mm -hmm. week. And I've been tracking that closely because I think that is more of indicating where the real estate market is going to be, in my opinion, mm -hmm. than tracking interest rates. I think this half a point, quarter point at these historical lows are still low. Right. Mm -hmm. It's still low. No doubt about it. Yeah. Oh, what's that looking? No, 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 I'm, I'm curious what that's been looking like. I'm sorry? The, the one you've been tracking. He still has momentum. Still momentum. He still has yeah. momentum, but, but mm -hmm. nationally it's dropping. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So uh, to Jerry's point all the time, I think our region's a little bit different than, yeah. than yeah. a national uh, footprint on that end of it. But some of the, what I'm reading on the national level, those week over weeks, month over months applications are dropping a little bit. And it's because a half a point, a quarter point is pulling a lot of people out of the yeah. market. Right. But the pool is so darn deep. And I won't use my acronym anymore, because <laughs> my story, because it's, it's old. But the pool is deep. Uh, on that on that end of it, so it lowers a little bit. It doesn't lower yep. down to down to zero. I mean, exactly. here think about this. We talked about this yesterday. Um, we saw a six percent uptick in year over year applications for folks trying to go to UVA. Wow. 
So the, the class, so that would be the class of 2026. Yeah. Um, total applicants, 6% increase over the class of 2025. Wow. And UVA is in the business of making money. So, so if they have more qualified students than ever before, they're going to accept more than ever before. And if they exactly. accept more than any, ever, any before, they're going to need a place to live. Exactly. Yeah. And if cool they one. need a place to live, even if it's the rental market, it's going to have an impact on the resale market oh, as exactly. well. Exactly. Because we don't have enough houses. And, and if they hire more people or if they admit more students than ever before, they're going to have to hire more people, people to service or to will, will guide here. or professorship or feed mm -hmm. those, those, those students. And we haven't even discussed, we talk about it all the time, but I mean, I think it's going to be hugely impactful. Like, what is this $125 million data science school? on Ivy Row going to do. Have an impact. I mean, I, I, don't, I just don't see the momentum of no inventory in real estate cooling down anytime soon. And locally, in, locally. 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 Exactly. Here. And yeah, that's, we're that's the whole very... Point. Well, in the time of Braden and Pleasantness, we got hurt a little bit here, and man, I'm staring at mom's cookies, and I'm just, my stomach <laughs> is rolling. <laughs> Roll it back for Keith. <laughs> so um, we, 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 we got impacted, but not... It wasn't a global impact, right? Mm -hmm. Certain individuals, yours truly, and some certain folks got leveraged, in, got impacted. Who were leveraged? Yeah. Frankly, yeah. That's the key. you don't build a seventeen million dollar subdivision without being leveraged. Of it's course. just it's just the way life is. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's interesting to do that and and, and kind of track that. But I'm That's tracking. Why I like paying the mortgages off. <laughs> What did he, he, he just say? That's why you, you like paying. That's why he likes paying the mortgage. Like, but mortgage. I saw your Tuesday tip, so I thought about this conversation. Was it last Tuesday? It went on. I think it was. Yeah. I liked it though. I liked it. I liked it. Um, Neil Williamson. Uh, I love Xavier so much. Neil Williamson has this comment, that which is Xavier, uh, yeah, uh, associated with Nicholas uh, monetary monetary policy. Taking away the punch bowl refers to central bank central bank action to reduce the stimulus and thereby stop the party. Um, the term was coined by Federal Reserve Chairman William McChenzie Martin Jr., who sat at the head of the Fed table from 1951 to 1970. Okay. Wow. So not, not the not first, first one, one, but yeah. thank Look you, Neil. you, huh? Close, yeah. yeah. Wow. Look at you. Which is an interesting Once smart year. That is a very yeah. smart comment, which yeah. goes to show you the changing nature, I think, also that we have to take into account of the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve's initial mandate, its dual mandate, is simultaneously like to hold back inflation and to reduce the unemployment rate, right? The issue is those things, A, are contradictory. In other words, t typically that's not what t would happen, right? Secondly, at the very beginning, it, it for focused foremost on inflation, right? Because you would have these big remember? inflationary <laughs> booms sure. which would result in recessions. And, but now it's, it's hard not to look at the Federal Reserve and say there are so many other things that they are involved in now in terms of holding so much U.S. government debt, being looking into unemployment almost as much, if not more so, than inflation in recent years. Because you did argue they, they basically were pushing deflation in recent years. And so the, you, look at, you look at things that just say there's so much involved in what the Federal Reserve is doing now that you can't even, even that punch bowl comment from the 50s probably no longer even does applies it apply. to it doesn't apply. current Federal Reserve. Because it was yeah. the 1950s. Because it was the 50s. It <laughs> doesn't apply. I, well, okay. I was going to say, remember who changed the mandate was Jimmy Carter, if I'm correct. He I can't changed, remember he when added the mandate in the changed. unemployment mandate, if I'm, if I'm correct. I'm sure I think Neil, Neil, Neil will correct, correct me if no, no, I'm wrong. No, 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 I believe it was Jimmy mandates. Carter who added yeah. that in, and so that made it more complicated for the Federal can Reserve. Can we get back to the, the Bullard comments? And, and, and Xavier's point <laughs> is exactly right. Is like, when is a good time to do this? Um, you know, maybe the Fed's job is not to manage perception. Um, Although but, they do. I mean, doing the comments at a time when January was but, was but miserable for us. What the Fed's been doing forever. Was they, always they did. They did. so. Yeah. So I mean, so I mean, so you know, and Nikki well, was right. Nikki was January. right. But but when do we do it? Just before Christmas. Well, I mean, so initially at, at, at good times. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but that's the point. The point is, I, I agree 100 percent. During good times is when they should be doing these things, right? I mean, I, I go back to uh, I think it was 2012 when things were a little bit better. They could have been raising rates, right? Mm -hmm. And then they didn't. Then and then in 2016 when the economy was starting to boom, they started raising rates. So it always feels like they're they're behind the eight ball. They're they're they they're, they don't do it at the right time. Now. These guys are smarter than I am, so maybe they're seeing things that I don't uh, see, right? No, 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 they're not smarter than you are. 
I wouldn't well, well, I'm, the mm -hmm. point is, I don't know what they see exactly. I mean, I don't know what you they're may, looking you, at when they make the decisions. You may not the be decisions. looking at the same information, but you're mm -hmm. definitely. That's right. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, so my I'm issue is, saying, when uh, do they do it? The cookies, that's all. <laughs> they, no, no, I'll tell you when they do it. They want to hold on to their job for the next term. So well, they don't want to screw that's over any, whoever's sitting. That's any bureaucrat. Right, but that's part of the stuff. issue with the Federal Reserve as a bureaucratic industry. I mean, look at Yellen. Now she's the secretary. Secretary Treasury. Secretary Treasury. Even though she did a, an atrocious job when she was uh, Federal Reserve Chairman, I mean, she was uh, I, personally. I thought if, that her the way she handled the federal job was just as bad, if not worse, than Powell's been doing. I mean, I can't imagine Powell's going to do another term. Well, maybe not. I mean, Powell is, is, is Powell, Powell's 69, 70. Oh, they'll sit there well, until he's, he's they, got the speaking the circuit when he's yeah. done with the... Yeah, he's going to be yeah, a higher he's a mercenary speaker. Absolutely. Yeah. Higher but, gun. But yeah. they like being in the chair as long as they can. I mean, let's be real. It's what's power the oldest, and it's fun. What, what's the oldest Fed chair we've ever had? Probably Greenspan, I would think. I was thinking Greenspan. How old was... Let me do a green, uh, Greenspan yeah, I don't know, but... Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, well, he always looked old anyway, so I don't know. It could be, <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's the you job. Know, to you and I, everybody else looks old. You know, us young guys. It's not true. Xavier's got yeah, a fresh guy haircut. Like Xavier, He's looking it's good. born in 82, is it? <laughs> yeah, totally. So it, it's a thing that we struggle with, Xavier. I know, I, I know. I get it. Yeah. We have to live with it, though. We, we live Some with of us it. can't understand it. You know, <laughs> some of you can't understand us it? Us old guys. Us old people. He was in office until, so quick math here. He was in office until 2006, Greenspan. Yeah. Um, and he was born in um, 26. Okay, so there's your guy so right was, there. What was that? What's that, 80? 70, 81. 81. 81. 74, 80. 80, 80 you're right. 80. Yeah, almost 81. So good night. Good night. Oh, no. Yeah, no. She's going to be there forever. You ready for the next 11 years? No. Well, don't, don't, you know, the, the only issue, Jerry, is like sometimes you wish and then you get somebody who's worse. Yeah. And so, well, I, I wish we had Powell back. I remember those conversations when Greenspan was in. Yeah. yeah. I remember them very Absolutely. Early. Absolutely. Don't change them. He went through multiple different presidents mm. and... And do that. So let's. I, I want to kind of bring it back a little locally, yep. uh, because oh. Nick did a bunch of numbers and did some crunching. Oh, I did homework. Local yeah. numbers. He did, some, he did some. He did some homework. And, oh. And in maybe, my spare time. In your spare time. That I have none. The uh, the boss gives you spare time over there. No, what are you talking oh, he actually about? did yeah, that. Right. I mean, his girlfriend, his fiance. She's my fiance watching. Fiance gave me. <laughs> Is that uh, the fact you did that on I, Elizabeth Lamar? Yeah, I was. Yes. yes. If she watches, she's giving you love, some you. Pops. Um, love you. Honey. So yeah, lo love you, babe. So so let's talk about what it's about. Is <laughs> yeah, it, we're, emailing we're, you on Valentine's Day. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank um, you for thinking of me about Of course. Day. So um, the ten cents rate. So let's talk about that. One of the things that you know, because we always talk about, like, so what impact does taxes have? We look. So mm -hmm. Xavier and I are the ones who usually run the financial plan, and so for those who are not familiar with what the financial plan is, we take it's a holistic view of your entire financial life put together. So we will, and and the goal of it is to determine sort of like, well, we work with your goals most of the time. But that's what we normally do. But I would say that for most people, it's when can re can I retire? Age. Do I have yeah. enough that I can retire comfortably? And how long can I make it on the finances? You know, projecting. How long do my funds this, last? Yes. How long will my funds last? Those kind of numbers. And what we're what we look for, and I think this is an important part. So what Xavier and I looked at is that the thank you the standard deviation for the average life expectancy is about 10 years so we try to make sure that funds last for the person until to, 90. To bring that well, to, to make that in layman's terms. In layman's yeah. terms, yeah. Yeah. In layman's terms yeah. you probably yeah. often am see I that. Am I in that standard deviation or am I not? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I I mean, you're basically saying there's a margin of error. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in other words, if you see the number that what's the average life expectancy for a man? 60? It's 76. 76. Yeah. Right? When you see that number, Half of people 66, will 86. live ten years longer than that. Got it. In yeah, other so words, it's the median. It's the median. It's the median. Yeah. So, the, but the thing is, the standard deviation is large. Is that's a very large ten years? is a very large long number. Time. Yeah. It is a large number, and a lot of um, this is this is what makes I guess emergent special is that unlike other financial planners or insurance companies, we're not targeting the average. We're targeting the standard deviation. And the reason why is because, again, it's like Alex said, if you have a 50% chance of living beyond, we don't want your money to run out before that. And that's a common thing these days. I'm literally having this conversation with my parents, right? Yeah. They're running out of, they're, they're, they're out, oh. literally I had this conversation outliving, on Sunday. Yeah. They're outliving their money. They're, yeah. they're, he's on a New York City Fire Department pension, right? right? Inflation is killing them. Exactly. Right? right? Taxes is killing them. Um, 
And I said, go live with my sister. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we offered them to come, but they, they, at the moment have refused. refused. Yeah. They, they, the standard answer is, yeah, we like Yona, but they never finished the rest yeah. of it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they do. We like Yona. We all like Yona, just so you Everybody know. Everybody yeah. loves Yona. Yona's the yeah. best. Yeah. Love we Yona. all like Yona. Love Yona. And that's how we yeah. stop. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have a cookie. Yeah, go we'll ahead. Have... So... But no, and it's interesting because Keith was bringing up the fact that taxes, inflation are the biggest killer. That's what we historically have found. One thing I wanted to do is so before coming on the show, I took two different. I made a financial plan that was hypothetical based on two different individuals, um, hypothetical individuals that would be living in Charlottesville if there were a ten percent. Uh, Increase, increase in the uh, ten cent, ten cent, the ten, ten cent, cent tax increase in the property increase. tax. There we go. That's right. Did Thank you factor you. in you, the Jay. assessment increase as well? I so shout out to Neil Williamson. Yeah. I used numbers from the uh, Freedom for Recognized Economic Enterprise yeah. Forum, right? And he, according to them, the f- average house is worth four hundred ten thousand dollars. And then he gave the different property taxes before, including the assessment and with the assessment and the tax increase. And so I used those numbers, in, and then I. Kind of like also cross reference the other, the average person will cost a whole bunch of different sources, including the U.S. Economic Census. I used Albemarle County's numbers to find out like what is sort of like okay, what are the medium household incomes? What are the med- like how much would you be spending? You know, what would be the social security you'd be getting if you made that much? And so I found my results are on the back page that for so the first I I called him income one is Raphael just to Raphael. A, Raphael and okay. Ignacio were my two okay. examples because I like those names. The mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> no. Ignacio, Ignacio, Ignacio was, was not. Was I was not. Raphael because of Raphael yeah. Nadal, the, the best tennis yeah. player ever. And mm. um, Ignacio is just because it sounds cool. Okay. Um, I like the name. Or St. Ignatius. Ignatius. Yeah, no, we can talk tennis anytime you want. I love tennis. Um, that was a good match. Yeah, it was. It was. So Raphael is the one who is making the household income of about 80000 which from what I, my research showed that like is that the is median? the median household income. The median income for an individual was around 51000 so that was Ignacio. I assume that there was, it's kind of like the expenses of a four-person household, so I assume wife and two kids. And then we went forward from that. The difference between having your, the, the increase in the assessment and the tax rate for Raphael was five years out of, of longevity, so which words, means so decree decree. he lasted five more years than normal. L- no, he lasted less, five years. Less. Less. So in other words, less. if the, less. the if 10 cent if happens the, and the assessment increase, five years that's wiped off the longevity. So, that's huge. The time and, it is. and the funny Good thing Lord. is, interestingly enough, my target had been 91, th- like basically the 91 age, 91. age, age 91, age 90, 91, to make sure that I was, tar- if I was the financial planner, I'd be doing so this. So this, this drops him from 91 to 86. This drops him from 91 to 86. So I'm so glad you've got all my money because that means I'm going to live to 91. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do. Thank we'll, you. Thank you. Well, you, you may not live to 91. Know. Your money will survive uh, to 91. No, no, no. I Mrs. like the way Smith you said it. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's 91. <laughs> and beyond. A little you know. boyfriend. Yeah. Full With focus, <laughs> Keith. So, focus. Anyway, back on track. For Ignacio, the difference was roughly about four years so out of his longevity. Now, so that means that, again, so if he was targeting... It's not impacting nine, the wealthy. It is impacting both. It is yeah. impacting... I expected it would impact the um, lower income slightly more, but the opposite happened. So the person with the higher income was impacted uh, slightly more. Mm-hmm. Those numbers, obviously, everything will could possibly change because you could expect somebody to change their behavior, right, if you're property taxes are going up yeah but all, that would, but all that would mean also is that they would also not that they would people around the city and county would have less of an economic impact as well so you'd see the they economy because they have less, money, spend. They have money, less to money to spend so this i mean again part of what we try to do as financial planners is to make sure that everyone maintains their standard of living right you don't want us if you like if it's important to you to buy like organic eggs or something like that you don't want to go to i'm not going to assume that all of a sudden they're not going to they're going to swip to the switch to the cheapest egg possible, right? So we're trying to maintain like their lifestyle. But this is a real world thing. This is a real world it thing. Is. This yeah. is exact. This is if we were looking at a person with these numbers, this is what we would see. I'm have had this literal without knowing about this. Literally had this conversation with my parents this weekend. You know, they now don't shop at Whole Foods anymore. 
Yeah. Mm, they've changed the... They, they, they can't afford Whole Foods right. any longer. It's dubbed Whole Paycheck for a reason, Whole yeah. Foods. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Which, which, which <laughs> is a shame. Is like the, your goal, like in an ideal world, like your goal shouldn't in retirement shouldn't be, now I have to stop doing all the things I like doing because I no longer have enough money, because, because inflation has increased this dramatically. But unfortunately, that's what a lot of people are seeing, just the... The inflation is so dramatic, it's the number one negative impact yeah. on your on how you are in retirement because you're living on a fixed income at right. that point. But we're seeing and, no and we, we see that. taxes, though, we at see the same that. time. Yeah. That was the whole point of this yeah. exercise. Because it's an inflation. Like, I mean, yeah. a tax is an it inflation. Is. We already know that, right? And it's an inflation that, that it's is... It's so regressive. Exactly. And it stays mm -hmm. there. It doesn't. It yeah. never goes away, right? And, well, and, and the and terrifying painful. thing is, Michael Payne said last week on, on our show that this $0.10 real estate tax rate increase... Um, is not only being considered for this year, but if they want any chances of doing any capital improvement projects for the next 10 years, they're likely going to have to do another one, not at the 10 cent clip, but another tax rate increase the following year and the year after that. Ouch. They're, they're going to drive. They're going to push out. They're going to gentrify the community. Yeah. Yeah. They will gentrify the community. Well, m my worry is that there are going to be people that actually cannot afford to live just a normal life anymore. Well, that, that's what's happening. They're going right. to sell their home. Yeah. 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 Because, I mean, if Keith's yeah. Keith parents can't go to Whole Foods, what are they going to next not be able to go to? Because at some point, you're like, if you're living on Walmart, what, what cheaper option is there? You know what I'm saying? Like, at some point... Like you're gonna have to either cut something out of your life. I mean, how do you how do you do that? You the, you you sell your house and, and you move in with your kids. Yeah. So, this is my notes, by the way. Yeah, I like your notes. <laughs> but that into that scenario, um, literally um, in pre preparation for today, there I can't go into details, but there is a home in Charlottesville that we're going to close next week that was bought two years ago. The uh, appraised value. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the market value was three hundred. It is now four hundred. It went up a hundred grand within two years on that end of it. But the tax rate uh, for two years ago was tax assessed value was two twenty one. If we budget in fifteen percent, which is what this is going to happen, mm -hmm. um, they're going to be paying rough, roughly twenty bucks every hundred thousand dollars of a tax assessed value. So they're going to probably go up another forty, fifty bucks a month just on their tax bill. Now, there's a huge delta between tax value and market value. It's, a, it's mm -hmm. almost a couple. It's uh, roughly, hold on a second, I got a number here somewhere in my chicken scratches here. It's uh, roughly $221,000 difference between, but thank you, between mm -hmm. the tax value and the current market value on that, end, on that end of it. But to Jerry's point, two years from now, I just I projected out that house in ten years with a three percent year over year increase. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be roughly five hundred twenty two thousand. So the bottom line is is they have this equity. They have this hundred thousand dollars worth of equity. They're going to pull out of their house. Mm -hmm. Is that calculated into this? So in other words, if I bought a home today, right. ten years from now, I'm sixty, which will be seventy. Right. I have roughly a hundred and. Hold on a second. I would. I did an amortization table on it. Hold on one second. Um, I'll end up with two hundred thirty-two thousand dollars in ten years. Is that calculated into that? So, so the answer is the answer is that you, you can't. What am I going to do with that? So you can't. In other words, what we're trying to do, and, and everybody has a say different. You don't want to leave your yeah. home. So yeah. yeah, what we're trying to do is say, do you want to stay in your home for the rest of your life? The answer is yes. And how you know how long will you you will survive? There's always at the end at the end of the road. There's always, without any doubt, you can sell your home, right, right. and then rent, right, and that will carry you for X number of years, right. Mm -hmm. But the goal here, when you do a financial plan, is not to say let's let's look yeah. at a situation where you're also selling your home because people's like, I don't really, yeah. you know, I don't want you to know, sell my home. Doomsday. Which, but it's understood well, there's that no you such have thing that. Thing is a forever home. Understood. True, understood, but at the same time, I, you can't also assume that people are. Do you, then you want to sell. So many assumptions yeah. that and you can't that project going, when that's going to happen. You don't yeah. know when that's going to happen. You don't know what the value it's going to be when it happens. Sure. Nor does your client want to hear that. Yeah, I don't want to be like, mm, you know, just so you know, if you, you, you sell your home in three years, you should sell your house. The other thing I will say is that it's funny. That's of, exactly what my mother and father said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but at the same time, right? It's it's our job as financial planners not to be like, yeah, you have to sell your home, sure. right? The idea is to be like, well, I mean, if you want sell your home talk to Keith if you want to stay in your home we'll try to figure yeah. out how you do that the other thing I will mention is that 
most financial planners assume a 30% drop in expenses after retirement. The reason they do that is because you're not driving to work, you're not buying clothes for work, you're not doing buying lunches out, you're not doing things that you'd have to do for work. I don't. We don't agree with assuming that because some people want a I vacation. Mean, either they want yeah. a vacation, they have want a hobby, or here's another one: some people are working from home right now, so their expenses aren't really going to go down because they're not driving. So how do you adjust mm -hmm. for that? So. I, I, we do minimal adjustments because you cannot, you cannot be too flippant with people's money to make a rosier picture than it has to be. Love it. I think that was the key right there. It's like, <laughs> yeah, they could go on and sell their home for more, but at the same time, what if they wanted to live in the same place? Their issue may be the same if they're exchanging the value of different homes. They'd have to, you would have to downsize. You so would have well, to downsize. And then you've got the whole, in this conversation I have with my parents is exactly this. They don't want to move out. They, yeah. they literally don't. Their master bedroom's on the second story. You know, they're in their early 80s. Um, you know, the next level will be assisted care assisted or some sort of other... Assisted care is going to be more expensive than the house. Uh, I, I, that's the reason I brought Hence, it up. Jerry. Literally more expensive than the Hence house. long-term care insurance. Yeah. So that would make these numbers that, even worse, though, if they did that then, right? Th that's or, the reason I brought it up. It, right. it'll, make the, it'll, it'll, mm -hmm. it'll take that time backwards. You're right. assuming... Well, there well, are medical is, costs and care that are Which is an interesting included, point so because it goes to up. show that the one of the major impacts of these types of property tax increases is to further incentivize the selling of that home. In other words, to your point of gentrification, in other words, if the delta is that dramatic, you sit there and say, I can no longer, I, I can no longer afford to live in this area because my, my cash flow has been impacted. I cannot sell a piece of my home. It's not like I can sell like $100 sell it, yeah. worth of my home to pay it. Therefore, the only way for me to actually use my home to pay this tax increase is to sell the home and move to a smaller And on top of that, rates are going up. So people have less purchasing power. So that's literally making the community as rich as humanly possible right now. No, well, there's then, some, there's uh, some options there because you're starting to see mm -hmm. this. You can Airbnb out a room, or mm -hmm. you know, or mm -hmm. put a, put an auxiliary dwelling unit uh, at a hundred thousand plus dollars. If you more, if you way, can't way, afford way, your taxes, how are you going to build an ADU in your backyard? Well, that's part of what I was I'm working on out in Seattle, where the land trust comes in and and does that. So. My parents don't have to do this, and they yeah. build it, and they get a, they get the equity, or or they get some part of the rent, some part of the equity, and then they can stay in there. The other thing we talked about also, if you're at a certain income, and and you, you at a certain age, you actually can have some relief, tax relief, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you need to look into your jurisdiction on what it is. There are some. You and know, another trend that's happening is assessments are going up so fast that 11.69 percent of the people that qualified for tax relief last year have been priced out of that Ouch. tax release because <laughs> assessments have gone up and their values have uptick. So you've literally mm -hmm. taken out 12 percent of the people no. that could have gotten no. this tax relief. So live new live news. I literally just got a text on something I'm supposed to close tomorrow. That will not close because the tax assessment just kicked the buyer out. Yeah. That literally Ouch. is happening as I'm looking wow. at it right yeah. now. This tax assessment just kicked the buyer out. That will not this be able to close. This is the effect of taxing illiquid assets. Literally. And this was an affordable housing project in Charlottesville. Which is no longer affordable. Which mm -hmm. now they yeah. can't and close. Dude, and guess well, what's going to happen next year? And guess what's going to happen next year when the counselors are coming, sitting where Nick is sitting right now, and said this is going to happen again next year? And guess what's going to happen again next year when the University of Virginia admits more students, hires more people, and assessments go up again? Yeah. This is going to get yeah, worse. They, and, and, and as you said, the biggest problem here is that who it crushes is the, is the, people, is the people that yeah. are already retired. Right, mm -hmm. and they're sitting there and going. I know, I know I get Social Security. Maybe I get some income out of my my savings. But if 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 the returns on the market aren't equal to or greater than inflation, you're in trouble. If they're not equal to or greater than the tax inflation, mm -hmm. you're in trouble. And you know that your Social Security never goes up equal to inflation. It's lower than inflation rate. So no matter how you look at it. The senior citizen is always in trouble, always behind the ball, and, and, and yeah, I mean, it gets to a point where it's like, I have no choice but to sell and hopefully then rent somewhere. And as you mentioned, Jerry, if, if the, it's here locally, if the University of Virginia is increasing the it's amount of students that come in, rental's going to go well, through. What's happening is a switch from owning, a switch from a senior citizen owning a home to selling it and renting is a loss of generational wealth. 
because that home would be passed on and, and, to and, a descendant who now will not receive that home. <laughs> and intangibly demoralized spirit. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Well, because they can think of this. They're doing all this for new capital projects and all these. If they reshuffle, the, the effect of raising the taxes will reshuffle the population. And then, again, the city will be chasing how to manage this complete reshuffle. If they're doing all these things for different, like, because I, I believe the, the, the rationale was school reconfiguration. Yeah. So what happens if they move people all around? And well, that's why they said that. You said the people who will benefit from this foolish situation won't be living here anymore. The people that yeah. we're doing this project for are not in the community. That's right. And it's just the rich kids that get the reconfiguration when it was intended for educational equity. Right. And here's the thing. Mima and Poppy, when, when Poppy had to sell his home in Naples because he couldn't afford it anymore because he was retired yeah. and moved in with us, with our family, his health started to decline. He started losing, uh, uh, he, he lost his, his reason. He didn't have his mango garden in the back. He didn't have the things that he could do. He lost his, like, almost a purpose. Exactly. And when yeah. he lost his purpose, he started losing the zest to live. Yeah. Yeah. I literally yeah. had that conversation with my mother this morning. I said, Mom, how you doing? You didn't look, we were over at the house for football. Yeah. She goes, I'm bored. I said, well, you know, you can come on over and cook dinner. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but but that uh, do, do me a favor. Uh, <laughs> Please uh, tag uh, Michael Payne. Okay. Literally, as I'm sitting here, I'm trying to save an affordable housing deal that is falling apart. Dude, affordable housing are buzzwords utilized to win council elections. I, I got it, but I'm trying to save a deal <laughs> so we can close well it tomorrow. Yeah. On, yeah. On that. It's a farce. Yeah. Um, so questions on the feed. We, we haven't uh, mentioned the feed here. We got to get to the feed here. Um, Bill McChesney has a couple of examples here. Um, 1109 Holmes Avenue in Charlottesville, Virginia, sold for 345000 this month. It last sold in the 60s for $18,500. Wow. 345K, $18,500. And we're talking, what, 60 years there? Um, the assessed value was two forty five. dollars It sold for hundred k over assessment. That house selling for three forty five will jack up the neighbor's tax assessments. And then he also wants Xavier's take um, on reverse mortgages. Ooh. Ooh. Reverse My father mortgages. literally asked that question on, yeah. on some. They're gaining traction with TV commercials. Have you noticed that? The Absolutely. reverse commercials? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I think without any doubt, I mean, I'm not necessarily a fan of reverse mortgages, but, but there is something to be said about them, right? So you just have to make sure that when you go to the bank or you go to whoever's doing the reverse mortgage, you look at the fine print, right? Because that's, that's, the, that's the big deal. But, but it can work. I mean, reverse mortgages can work for, um, in, you know, in, in different circumstances. The issue is that the reverse mortgage is, at this point with low interest rates is working against you, right? I mean, in other words, you're, you're selling something at very low interest rates. Didn't so you're not getting the age much. to 55 just recently? I believe it, you can apply yeah. for Up them. Up for reverse mortgage. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, but my point is you're not getting that much because rates are so low. Got so, it. again, that's... That's the that's, that's the issue. One. But I mean, if you want to stay in your home and don't want to go anywhere, it, it is an avenue that you need to uh, you, you can pursue. Mm -hmm. Well, and the sad part is though, you would hate to see people though forced into a reverse mortgage by circumstance. Yeah, that's predatory. By, yeah. Because of the fact, well, no, because of also the fact that again, from a generational wealth building perspective, you are taking something out of the hands of an asset that will grow over time out of the hands of your family and transferring it to an institution. So that's literally the conversation I had with my father on on Sunday and 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 I you know I, you know and it's to Jerry's point they do a super great you know when you have I mean it's uh, like Joe Fies been making the pitch right now. Oh yeah Tom Selleck Tom Selleck I mean Tom Selleck makes the pitch and everybody goes oh it must be okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, he's great in blue bloods though. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> as, I agree. A, as a New York cop fireman family it must be true. If, if, if Tom, 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 Tom Selleck, Selleck said, said, but, yeah. Yeah, and, The reality is Tom Selleck has $50 million or whatever he has and will never, ever do a reverse mortgage. It's true. Yeah. One hell of a mustache. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we got more mustache power on this table than we you did. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. feel, in Judah too, I feel uh, at a loss here. I'm very uh, jealous of the, upper, the, the facial hair. Neil Williamson, medium property tax, Buckingham County, 
Are these, I think these are the year, right, Neil? Uh, Buckingham County, 558 bucks a year. Charlottesville, 2,486 a yeah. year. Almar County, 2,219 a year. My home this year will be almost equal to what Albemarle County's taxes in wow. Fulvana County. I'll be paying almost the same amount of cash. Wow. Sick, wow. comparable house. It, it's about a thousand bucks off, but mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty darn close. Yeah. So, so what are we gonna have gonna happen? Moving further and further well, to the just, If I no could doubt. just tag on to the end of the Bill McChesney comment, like for the reverse mortgage, people that are looking to stay in their home and like, that's why you talk to a, a financial advisor because there could be on the other end, like, there could be income that you could be making off of the markets that can help prepare you. Like if you're talking to a real financial advisor, you're not just having it sit in the bank in cash or in a savings account where it's not making any money. Like go talk to someone because like that could be the difference. Well, that's what the boomers do, home. right? That's mm -hmm. th that's what the boomers do. They keep their money in the bank. So let me ask you a, a pivot question. My parents are, sure. are 80, 81, 82. It, they think it's too late to sit down and have a conversation with folks like you. But, no, never. never. And so tell us why. Well, just there's, there's always other things. You'll be amazed how many people come to us, and their 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 assets are in in a in a way that's not productive for them. It's either basically all in cash, or they have it invested in stocks that are not yielding income. Because when you reach a certain age, right, especially when you're in retirement, income is your primary. Goal. In other words, growing your wealth at age 80 or 70, 80 is not the primary concern anymore. It's the cash flow. Sure. In other words, if my wealth is, is growing but I can't access the cash, in other words, if it's in a house, I can't access the cash of it. It's irrelevant to me that my net wealth has gone up. Sure. I can't access this cash. So it's always important because the goal there is to make sure that the assets you have are cash. working for you? Are they producing the cash flow to meet your needs? And are there ways to do it? Sometimes we'll even have people on the elderly side, if they, especially if, if they, and this may not be the case when you're 80, but if you're 60, 70, sometimes they still have a mortgage. And their inclination is, let me pay, I have this bundle of savings, let me pay off the mortgage entirely. And we'll sit down and say, no, wait a second. Look at your mortgage rate. Look at the, the rate you can get an income in the markets you could be netting yourself some income that will be useful to so, you. So I have to ask you a question. Are you ready for more Smiths? Yep. Because I'll, I'll, hand my, I'll, I'll make the connection <laughs> because they need to talk. Because literally that's the conversation we yeah. had this week. I'm going to pay off my mortgage. I go, no, 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 yeah, no, no, yeah. do that. Yeah. Uh, and, it, it, it also, you got to think about liquidity, right? No, those once you, Why, you take Didn't they buy assets. in the 90s? Didn't they? No, so they've been multiple homes. So the one that they, yeah, I think you're right, actually. Late so it's been, we're, we're at 30 years here. It's 2022. Well, so you remember the time of great unpleasantness, so. They pulled from there? They, we pulled, we all pulled from there to, to make this happen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so the issue is, the one thing that people forget about also is that, yes, you have a mortgage. People say, I, I don't want that debt, but you're taking out of your savings to pay off for that mortgage, and now you've reduced liquidity, right? Because you just never know when you're going to need that liquidity. You never know when you're going to need special, mm -hmm. you know, funds for, for whatever health it may reasons. be. Health reasons, right? So it's good to have... If I can, as long as I can continue to pay off my Those mortgage, I'll rate it low. Yeah, well, yeah, it was. Um, it's it's good to keep it. And I mean, again, you, you got to do the right analysis. And Alex is right. I mean, once you get to a certain age, the key is income. And when you have inflation at seven and a half percent, eight percent, you got to find something that's generating income equal to that. Otherwise, so you're this in is happening live. Eight hundred bucks taxes went up on this house, which translates into sixty six dollars a month. Just kicked the buyer out. Yeah. Wow. Sixty-six dollars a month just kicked the buyer out. We're well, because you're already operating on thin margins. We're, we're it's, operating it's so on thin margins. So unaffordable. Like, yeah. Where the prices are this yeah. high, if you're probably, I'll bet, and I'll direct me if I'm wrong. When you've got people being on house, they're probably like just squeaking over. Yeah, yeah. Five so bucks, that shit's five out. bucks make it there. And, yeah. and and to cut to the chase, that was not the right buyer for the house. If that change got them out of buying this home yeah, but, because but, next year yeah, all next this year, is going to well, get yeah, worse. Could, exactly. They're going to lose yeah. it. They yeah. would lose the and home. And that's a conversation we have with first-time home buyers. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have, have the P&I, P&I, the principal and interest is, in my opinion, the best way to hedge against inflation. Then you have this. Then you have your taxes and your insurance, right? Mm -hmm. Your insurance goes up and down. You know, it goes up. I haven't seen it go down. <laughs> and your taxes never go down. Never go down. Never. And that's exactly, I mean, that's the point we make to everybody. In other words, your P&I, as you mentioned, 
that's lovely because we don't have to we don't have to stress that part of the equation with inflation because it doesn't go up right mm -hmm. but everything else we have to stress it and when you have taxes that are being stressed greater than inflation it just throws a monkey wrench into financial okay. planning. and that is why you can make a legitimate statement that home ownership might not be the biggest hedge against inflation well it, it is it is from from the principal and, and interest perspective it isn't on the tax on side the tax and that's right. and that's why the conversation we're having now about this 10 cents the right. conversation you've been having we've been having about keeping an eye on the budget right the conversation we're having keep an eye on your tax assess you get tax assessed as as bill as bill may know you can go ahead and you can contest this we've contested it in our home and got it lowered it was like you know, the, the number was obscene. I said, look, I'll tell you what, here's the deed. I'll be, you give me the money, I'll be more than happy to sign it over <laughs> to you. Mrs. Smith's been trying to get me to move forever, and I'll take that number. Well, no, no, no. I said, well, then you need to adjust it, because yeah. this is now the market value. Yeah. So they adjusted it down for us. There's a process to go through with that, on that end of it. But, um, I mean, but you, just, just to go back to what you said, though, I, I, I slightly disagree. In other words, buying a house is a great way, right? in inflationary environment, right? Because think about it, you are building equity. I mean, you know, Keith just talked about the fact that how houses have been going up. I mean, that's also inflation. I mean, that's inflation and the real well, estate. The, yeah. So if you're going up, if you're going up, you know, 30% over a two year period, you just built an enormous amount of equity. But that's on paper. Yeah. Would you and, want $400,000 of gold bars or $400,000 of hardy plank siding roof that needs to be replaced every 20 years, an HVAC that breaks every five years, a garbage disposal, a uh, refrigerator, um, but a equity, toilet. But equity of that nature but is always you take the 400K of gold <laughs> bouillon. Right, but you're living there, right? So in other words, it's either yeah, you, you're that. also living there. That's your home versus yeah. renting. So, when renting continues to go up, and then what do you have? And what is rent? Unless, you, unless that 400 dollars 400,000 of gold bullion allowed you to live in a market. Where are you going to store the 400,000 dollars? <laughs> that was not associated with tax rates like yeah. this. At the same time, though, no. I'm not sure. Gold, the price, the valuation of gold also. I think it's what he's saying. What I'm saying is equity of that size. Equity of that size. When you're talking 100 grand, 200 let's, grand, let's, it has to be in a volatile way if you're going to be earning anything more than it. Let's, put a, let's put a Fair. pause on this for a second, Fair. guys. What is every everybody who you see? What is their most largest asset and value. House. Their house. Home. This is their home. So is that what? the case? Almost always. Yeah. Almost yeah. always. Yeah. Okay. You know, at nine out of. At I out mean, of, by the time they get to retirement, if they've done a great job, yeah, their they're 401k or stock portfolio, portfolio is greater. Be the However, house. you know, out of nine, on out average, of 10, on average, yeah. yeah. You, yep. Most of your. Yes. It's going to be out of mm -hmm. 10, most of the folks, their largest asset is the home is that the they live Correct. The home that they live. Yeah. And that is. It have been the case and is historically across mm -hmm. across the country. As you said, Xavier, you're trying to flip that, right? You're trying to flip it so you have liquid cash. It's the liquidity that's the issue. In other words, long time over multiple generations, the home is, is where you want to be because it has, like I always quote from uh, the old Superman, the, the one with um, Christopher, Reeves. Christopher Reeves, the only thing you can make more of is land. Yeah. Right, so there's your increasing valuation. Who also said that? Aristotle. Well, let's do this one who said well, it. Who recently said that? Oh, so recently not recently said? compared to Aristotle. Oh, well, I don't remember. <laughs> I mean, it was that's a large, movie, that's a very, very long I'm sure there's quite a few point. people that yeah. Oh, come on now. Um, uh, it, it wrote Smith a couple of. that on real talk. <laughs> real talk. <laughs> uh, no, no. no. Um, uh, Samuel Clemens. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Gotcha. Mark gotcha. Twain. I didn't Mark know Twain. that. Yeah. I didn't know that, which makes complete sense. Yeah. So, I mean, that's your long-term picture there. It's when you enter retirement that, unfortunately, like you want something to be more liquid. Because yeah. you can't, again, you can't sell 5% of your home. You can sell 5% of a stock portfolio is the difference there. There you go. Um, good stuff today. Uh, Neil has thoroughly enjoyed this program and, and, and is content slinging left and right. We love you, um, Neil Williamson. Um, Bill is saying the, uh, the FLUM, the future land use map, is an inflation engine, um, and there's some strong truths to that. Multiple people, in, including our, our friend Sarah Kirkland, who's watching in Belmont, is, is saying that um, you guys are exactly right about affordable housing. It is a farce um, in this community. And Daniel Pettit says HOA fees will also knock out the buyers in purchasing. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. Yeah. Um, so a lot, any, any, any parting or closing thoughts from the uh, ERPI gentleman? Uh, closing thoughts. Just 
I didn't how, about a, how about a message to uh, leadership oh, in go. Charlottesville or Almar County? Oh. From, uh, Taxes should be the last you know, available <laughs> option. It should be the nuclear option. It should be the last red button that you ever press. Yeah, absolutely. That's I mean, I, it's, you know, the only, you the really only sad thing that. is no, in a time, no, in a time where inflation you know is that. running so rampant and so high, um, you would hope that everybody is trying to buckle down a little bit, and you would hope that, you know, your own government, your local government says, this is not the right time to impose a tax. This Thank you. A, a real. This is a real Amen. world yeah. thing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This yeah. is a real so world thing Hill, happening hello. right now. It's, at, it's not just real in world. theory. It's yeah. actual people are affected, and this can change the course of their. This can change the course of their entire Th this life. This young lady has no place to go if I can't make this work. Literally, will be homeless. Wow. Your so. thoughts, um, Alex <sighs> Herbie. I, I would love. I would love the perspective for leadership and county and city. It's. it's I think it just stems back down to, again, I think sometimes there's a temptation because government is not a household to not run it like one. But you need to recognize at least, look at the people that live. All of us who live in this area who are affected by this, right? Are the way we run our households is not. I don't have enough money, for what I'm spending. I need to go out and steal some money. You know what I mean? I need to go out and make mo most of the way it works is here's the money that I have. How can I use this most efficiently? And government, yes, is a little privileged in the sense that they have the ability to raise more money at certain times. That doesn't mean you should abuse it. Your first thought should be how can I be most efficient with what has currently be give been given to me by the people living here and that I am a steward of. I think we've lost a little bit of government at all levels is a steward of the taxpayer's money. It is not the, the we can't, you shouldn't think of yourself as the owner of taxpayer's money, you are a steward of it. They have, we have entrusted it to you, granted you took it by force, but like we have entrusted to you our the tax money, so. the power to do so, so that you can use it responsibly. And the last thing, your last resort, as Nidla said, should be, I have not done this, therefore I need to take more from you. In other words, if we as an advisor, if, I, if a client gives me hundred thousand dollars to take care of and I have to go back to them and say I gave you less I need no I need do you have some more yeah to, to earn the income that I promised I would get you in order to to fulfill what I promised I would deliver to you do you have some more money that you could give me sure they would come back to me and say you're doing a very poor job with my money I need to hire somebody else. I need to hire somebody else so you as the steward of the tradition your first inclination should be am I doing the best with the money I've currently been allotted. Pointed question. Leadership watches this too, so I'm stipulating yeah. that. Would you move forward with school reconfiguration in the city of Charlton? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I started to, to I might ask say you that yes or no as a whole. <laughs> so I think the question is not, what struck me with the school reconfiguration was not the idea huh? of it, but the price tag. I'm just, I'm somewhat at a loss why that is the price tag for school configuration. I would love to go, I mean, maybe I need to go more into the details, but it seems to be a very large price tag for school reconfiguration. I'm just, I'm a 75 little, for one school. Yeah, I'm, I'm just sitting there saying, where does the $75 million come from? At like, the, I mean, with why the collateral is that? Where is it going? Where is yeah. it going? I mean, yeah. like, where is the going? cost? I and mean, who's it going to serve when it's done? Yeah, I know where it's coming from. In other so, words, yeah. like, so why the reality is that the price of that tag? Is nobody really knows what that number is because they're not going to know what that number is until the plans are drawn. Yeah. The first meeting with VMDO, it came up at $81 million. So they were six million ahead in the first meeting. Six, six million out of budget in the first meeting. It just seems like a very large number. You know me. what I used to like? The fact that uh, at the end of every single year in ancient Athens, the guy who was in charge of the budget had to stand up before everyone in the city and read the budget for the entire year and a list. He had to stand the entire time on read the whole thing and he had to account for every single penny that was spent with sandals right with sandals and, and everything sandals. yeah sandals or rope. sandal toga no, yeah, well toga. no no toga sorry that was the romans tunic he had no, a tunic I'm sorry i went to, i went to uh, yeah, ancient animal that's house. different yeah. i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> something completely different look gentlemen um thank you as always i, I always walk out a whole bunch smarter from from this um at the moment um i need to Wrap no, you up. I know. Yeah, you I, need, I need to try to save a deal. So yeah. my little parting thought on this, um, because of these tax increases, there's eight people trying to figure out how to make this work. So 
the interest went up, this fell, fell apart. I've literally got a group text with eight individuals wow. flying on right now trying to get this. We'll figure it out. If we've got to put, take money of our own pocket to make it happen, we will make it happen. Yeah. But, but th that's just What wrong. is going to happen to this person when this goes up next year? We're, we're, we're literally texting about when that. When the gasoline gonna, goes up. Yeah, if it's yeah. $60 the, margin the, thin. Yeah. Well, that's why you know, it helps to have good people. Like you, Keith, and, that, you. and the people that I know that are on that group chat that are working yeah. on it. So we're, we're literally the good people to make up for yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we'll the failures. Sometimes you levels. need that initial start spot, Jerry, because you know you never know. You work a little bit more, you make a little bit more next year. You talk to a financial advisor, you talk to Keith, you talk to everybody you need to talk to. You can some maybe you can find a way to make that happen, but you need to get. I mean, the deal's got to close first, though. You know. Well, so there's so that everybody knows part of this is a, a homeowner education course yeah. mm -hmm. that you actually have to take. So we talk about this budget and stuff yeah. like that. But we're going to work through this. My point of, of of saying here is because of a proposed tax increase, they need to budget that in yep. on on the mortgage side, and we've got eight people wow. trying to figure out how to make this work. Yeah. Uh, fantastic show, Nicholas Erpy. Any any uh, thing you want to? I just noticed that Alex has a very much more calm way of saying the thing that I said. <laughs> that's usually, so that's usually that's, my role. I will leave it there. Alex said it perfectly. If you need me to pound the table later, I'll come back. But <laughs> oh, well, one of the reasons I like you is because of that emotion. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I do uh, appreciate that about you. Um, you guys are the best. Emergent Financial Services, the best. Find them online, Emergent Financial Services guys, and engage with them, meet with them and start planning for your future. They are also the uh, the stars of Today e Manana, which air Thursdays at 10.15 a.m. Their show airs Thursdays at 10.15 a.m. on this network, Today e Manana. He's Keith Smith of Yes Realty Partners, and Judah Wickhauer. Also the best. Yeah, also oh, thank the you. best. Thank you. Thank you. And Judah, also the best. Judah Wickhauer <laughs> yeah. is our unsung hero. Absolutely. Yes, over absolutely. Here. Man, Judah, we've been eating these things while you've been working. He had to. <laughs> we made Judah's you. Yeah, I made thank you, Mrs. Well Erpy, beforehand. for the uh, delicious Italian cookies as well. I'm Jim the I Love Seville show is up in uh, 50 minutes, guys. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.